Hi again, everybody. It's good to see you, the beloved in the beloved. So if you're in Christ, you're called beloved, and Christ is also called beloved, as well as other saints in him. So what we're doing is we're going through the book of Ephesians. We've gone over chapter 1. Now we're going to go over chapter 2. And so let's just look at chapter 2. We've got the Holy Spirit, so we can read his word, and the Holy Spirit will work with you to remind you of his word. And as you've read other things in the Bible, all those things will start to come together, that knowledge of him, that we can see Christ, you know, all through the scriptures, through the Old Testament, from Genesis, the prophets, and the history, and all this thing about what God's doing with people that he made, because he made everybody. Uh, in this world, everybody is made by God, and your life is valuable right from that inception in the womb. It is valuable, and and God wants us to know the truth and to be set free. So let's look at our this great teacher and apostle, Paul, who is teaching us and showing us things that um, Peter said were even kind of hard to understand, but Peter sure confirmed Paul. So let's start in looking at what Ephesians 2 says. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. So here Paul is saying, look where we are in Christ, that we're seated with him, but we also were once like everybody else in the world. Everybody comes from the same playing field. We all started there and we were following our own flesh and our lust. And like I said, you know, even with little children, we can see how they can so quickly turn to doing what they know is wrong and then hiding from it. But they need instruction. That's why it's great with Ephesians. This book is he is showing us to instruct the children also. So they, they will know the light and to show other people. And also we have some opposition. We saw how Paul was facing opposition from Jews, from Gentiles, and he's got a spiritual opposition that's coming from Satan himself also, and those spirits that are working with him. And you know how people, they begin to be manipulated by spirits to work against those that are faithful to Christ. All right, let's continue. Paul and Peter both agree on the things that they're saying. 2 Peter 3.10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We see Abraham looking forward to things. We see Paul looking forward to things, and we see Peter looking forward to things. Interesting, too, we see the coming day of the Lord when he's going to do judgment but when we see that, we also see that there's a judgment and then a new heaven and new earth, if you will notice, that the apostles are speaking of. Back to Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So I like that, you know, this picture here that I think a Russian um, person had done uh, quite a long time ago and where the Sadducees and Pharisees are bringing that woman before Christ who was a harlot 
But, you know, she called Jesus Lord and she set free where those not calling Jesus Lord, they were the actual harlot that instead of being faithful to Christ, because you'll see this, that Paul will liken this as to a marriage also, that the body of Christ should be turned to him like a wife and a husband. The, the wife should be turned towards the husband and submitted and faithful. And, but these men, they were not faithful to Christ. They were in opposition and actually following their father the devil is what it says. Okay, let's move on. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So where are we in Christ Jesus? And how did he do this? Remember the uh, lamb that was slain? The lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb that was slain. Only this lamb was worthy to open the seals. Christ is able to bring us through that veil to the Holy of Holies. Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God does love us, and just like the children when they turn and do wrong, you know, we want to correct them, we want to help them, and we want to love them. And it's so good to love these children, and what a blessing it is to be around children and, and to, to love them. And it's, it's good that we have a good God who wants to love us and be with us for eternity, not a short time. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And when I was looking at this, of course, it always makes me think of what we have in Isaiah 11 and 65, where we have things like the lamb laying down with the wolf, the leopard with the kid goat, the ox eating straw with the lion. Well, what we have is we have a tame and a wild. We have a clean and an unclean and so God is bringing this together and I think this is just a symbol about those believing Jews and the believing Gentiles coming together in peace and you see where also in Isaiah 2 4 you see where the sword is beat into a plowshear and the spear is beat into a, a pruning hook so something to prune the trees so this is about good things. Instead of fighting one another, all of a sudden they're doing good things. And you know, when you prune a tree, you're trying to do things that make that tree more fruitful instead of just fighting each other. So, and another reason that I think that, that in Isaiah this is a symbolic thing is when you look in Peter, when that sheet is let down and Peter's seeing this, the, all these animals and it says, eat, Peter, eat. And Peter's saying, no, not so, Lord, I have not eaten these unclean things. And God is saying, what I have made clean is clean. And then he, I want you to go to the house of Cornelius and share the truth with him. So Peter goes there, and it's not about the animals, but it's about these, these Gentiles that were unclean coming in into this by the Holy Spirit as the family of God. So that's amazing, and let's continue to look. So we're going to look at this, this grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to all men. Let's look at Titus 2.1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Great, we want sound doctrine. We don't want a false doctrine. That the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and patience. The older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. Great, that's another good thing about doctrine. Sound and speech that cannot be condemned. 
that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Wow, that's great. Not only to the Jew, but to the Gentile. Teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope. So here we're looking forward again like Abraham and uh, Peter and Paul. And glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us. That means buy us and rescue us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. And then so along those lines, let's go ahead and look at what 1 Peter 3 says. It says, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word. So wow, you could have a wife that's not, you know, she might be married to someone who doesn't even obey the word. That they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Well, we should fear God. And, you know, we're called to fear God and do good. It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. So that's where beauty is incorruptible in that spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. And Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good, and are not afraid with any terror. Okay, so now we got to kind of sort through what it was talking about in being afraid. Well, that word afraid, that fear, um, afraid, to, to fear, be afraid, and in reverence. And terror, let's look at that. Uh, a consternation, amazement, or dismay that hinders or throws into confusion. So, okay, we don't want to fear that or terror that throws us into confusion because we should not be confused. And a dismay, a dis means separation from, so disheartened, deprived of courage. We don't want to be discouraged, but we want to be encouraged. And it's from the word ability. So we don't want to be disabled, separated from ability. So this is great. We can have the fear of God, but we, we are still given ability by God through His Holy Spirit to have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome these fleshly things that we want to do in our own ways, but we got to turn it over to God and follow Him and His Holy Spirit. That sounds great. Okay, husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Well, see, that's another good way to look at that, too, because if we're looking at, uh, we, we should fear God, but we don't want to be discouraged, because if you were discouraged, if you were disheartened, um, if you were disabled, well, how can you even pray? We can, th that's not the kind of fear or terror that we have in Christ. It's knowing that he is the one that's in control, that when he judges, he, he will do a righteous judgment. And so we should fear God. Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. Child knows that the parent has power. And that the parent should have power to stop that child from crossing the road when, where they're going to get killed. And discipline also. God, he disciplines those that he loves. 
Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous. That's friendly and kind. And if you think of a royal court, you know, one who can be at a royal court, courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Wow, that's great. And let's look at Hebrews 11:8 to help us. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So see, Abraham was looking forward to something that God was doing, this city that God was making. And God is making this with faithful believers, and Abraham is faithful. And then in Revelations 21, 14, you say, See, now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And you see the city is made up of people, but it has a symbology, kind of like jewels and precious things. Back to Ephesians 2.11. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands. So the Jews would circumcise, and that was a symbol of something, and it was made by hands. But there's a different circumcision that God was pointing to, and this is about the heart. And number 12, it says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus. Now Christ, that means Messiah. That's just the uh, Greek, as well as Jesus, which means uh, God saves. You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Praise God, he purchased us. He redeemed us from a, a life of death to give us a life eternal. For he himself is our peace. Yes, he is the prince of peace who has made both one. Wow, the Jew and the Gentile, both one. There's no longer male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We're all one in him and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Well, to get to the Holy of Holies, you had to go through there, which only the high priest could go through. But Christ is our high priest, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death this enmity, this struggle between both of them. So that's where, you know, bringing the clean and the unclean, the wild and the tame together through Christ, that they're no longer fighting one another, but they're living and peaceful that, um, you know, that you're inviting your neighbor that you can be neighbors with each other, and it's interesting how God shows that. Romans eleven seventeen, And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, don't boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. See, we're all on Christ. You will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Don't be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Well, that's a good one about fear, you know, because it's talking about branches. So we here we have the olive tree we've got one that's been a cultivated olive tree and then a wild one the branches can be broken off because of unbelief and the wild shoot can be grafted on for belief 
and then this is all one, but it's the root. And Jesus, the root of Jesse, he's the root that everything's attached to that for it to have life at all. Okay, Romans eleven twenty two. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. So there's a condition there. It says, otherwise, you also will be cut off. Wow, so that's interesting. You can be a believer and then you can turn from God by unbelief again. It says, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. So, you know, any, anybody in the world, Jews can be grafted on by belief. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to the nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. So here we're talking about a mystery of these cultivated and wild coming in together as one. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Well, you've got the believing Jews and then you have the believing Gentiles. And see, in this way, all the believers can come in. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the only way that we have that our sins have been taken is by Christ who has taken all the sins on him so that as we turn to him, we can have forgiveness of sins and follow him as Lord and be faithful. And we need to be faithful because remember, by unbelief, by not walking in faithfulness, we are, can be tore off. But that doesn't mean you can, that you won't fall and make a mistake. Because everybody who does anything in this world, whether you're doing archery, you might miss the mark. That doesn't mean you're not an archer. If, if you're learning to work with horses, because you make a mistake with a horse, doesn't mean that you are no longer a horseman. You're just going to continue in that walk and you're going to continue to grow in it. So continue in Christ. Let's see what else. Ephesians 1, 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In Romans 9, 6, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. See what he's saying there? They are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But Isaac, your seed, shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these aren't the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. You know, you'll see some people saying that... Um, you have to be of this race to be part of God's people. And you don't see Jesus, and nor do you see the apostles saying anything like that. But it's something on the, the inner parts that God is looking. That's why you need God to look at the hearts. Okay, let's get back to Ephesians two seventeen and 18 here. It says, And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. In Acts 1, 8 it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of the sight. And while they looked steadfast, toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel who also said men of galilee why do you stand gazing up into the heavens this same jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven so interesting thing about this that as you look at the book of daniel you see daniel seeing a vision from heaven and i think 
yeah, he's got, there's two angels there, there at that vision. He sees one on one side of the river, one on the other side. So it's just interesting that he's seeing Jesus coming like to the throne. And these guys have seen Jesus left, but he's going to come back. And remember how uh, Paul also talks how we meet him in the air. And then there's judgment. And then you see this new heaven and new earth. So Ephesians 2.19, let's look at that. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. There's physical and there's spiritual. There's an earthly Jerusalem, there's a heavenly Jerusalem. There was an earthly temple, there's a heavenly temple. And that temple, it's made up of believers there and believers here that were all together, and God is bringing this whole thing together. Now let's look at Revelations 21.14. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, twelve thousand furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, one hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, then sapphire, then chalcedony, then emerald, then sardonyx, then sardis, then the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light." Yes, Jesus Christ is that light. He's the light that came into darkness. And the darkness didn't comprehend him, didn't seize him. You know, a lot of the world, they seize Barabbas. They want something that is of the world, that is going to do something for them, that's not going to confront things that uh, they don't want to confront. But God is here giving us, he is giving us the truth, Jesus Christ, that there is forgiveness of our sins through him, and that he can redeem us and he has redeemed us through his blood and that's a free gift by the grace of God that no one can boast in it because we can't by our works and our religious acts be worthy enough and turn to God but we need to turn to him humbly and obediently and then we'll have the power of God by his Holy Spirit to continue faithfully and have good works so praise God uh, go out and continue to be the light that Christ has called you to be in the name of Jesus. Amen.